Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week we bring you two stories by Virginia Woolf, an unwritten novel and The Mark on the Wall. Virginia Woolf is a stream of consciousness writer, as was James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, and Sylvia Plath, among others. For Woolf, the internal reality, that is, the reality of the mind, is more important than the external reality. Quote, Human beings think continuously, have fragmented thoughts, so a writer should incorporate that. It's tricky to read out loud, I found, so if you find yourself lost while listening, don't worry. You are, and so am I, lost in a train of thought. I hope you enjoy these stories by Virginia Woolf. An Unwritten Novel by Virginia Woolf Such an expression of unhappiness was enough by itself to make one's eyes slide above the paper's edge to the poor woman's face. Insignificant without that look, almost a symbol of human destiny with it. Life's what you see in people's eyes. Life's what they learn, and having learnt it, never, though they seek to hide it, cease to be aware of... What? That life's like that, it seems. Five faces opposite. Five mature faces, and the knowledge in each face. Strange, though, how people want to conceal it. Marks of reticence are on all those faces. Lips shut, eyes shaded, each one of the five doing something to hide or stultify his knowledge. One smokes, another reads, a third checks entries in a pocketbook. A fourth stares at the map of the line framed opposite. And the fifth, the terrible thing about the fifth, is that she does nothing at all. She looks at life. Ah, but my poor unfortunate woman, do play the game. Do for all our sakes conceal it. As if she heard me, she looked up, shifted slightly in her seat and sighed. She seemed to apologize and at the same time to say to me, If only you knew. Then she looked at life again. But I do know, I answered silently, glancing at the times for manner's sake. I know the whole business. Peace between Germany and the Allied powers was yesterday officially ushered in at Paris. Signor Nitti, the Italian Prime Minister. A passenger train at Doncaster was in collision with a goods train. We all know, the Times knows, but we pretend we don't. My eyes had once more crept over the paper's rim. She shuddered, twitched her arm queerly to the middle of her back, and shook her head. Again, I dipped into my great reservoir of life. Take what you like, I continued. Births, deaths, marriages, court circular, the habits of birds, Leonardo da Vinci, the Sand Hills murder, high wages, and the cost of living. Oh, take what you like, I repeated. It's all in the times. Again, with infinite weariness, she moved her head from side to side, until, like a top, exhausted with spinning, it settled on her neck. The Times was no protection against such sorrow as hers. But other human beings forbade intercourse. The best thing to do against life was to fold the paper so that it made a perfect square, crisp, thick, impervious even to life. This done, I glanced up quickly, armed with a shield of my own. She pierced my shield. She gazed into my eyes, as if searching any sediment of courage at the depths of them, and damping it to clay. Her twitch alone denied all hope, discounted all illusion. So we rattled through Surrey and across the border into Sussex. But with my eyes upon life, I did not see that the other travellers had left, one by one, till, save for the man who read, we were alone together. Here was Three Bridges Station— we drew slowly down the platform and stopped. Was he going to leave us? I prayed both ways. I prayed last that he might stay. At that instant he roused himself, crumpled his paper contemptuously, like a thing done with, burst open the door, and left us alone. The unhappy woman, leaning a little forward, palely, colorlessly addressed me, talking of stations and holidays, of brothers at Eastbourne, and the time of year, which was, I forgot now, early or late. But at last, looking from the window and seeing I knew only life, 
She breathed. Staying away, that's the drawback of it. Ah, now we approach the catastrophe. My sister-in-law. The bitterness of her tone was like lemon on cold steel. And speaking not to me, but to herself, she muttered, Nonsense, she would say. That's what they all say. And while she spoke, she fidgeted as though the skin on her back were as a plucked fowl's in a poulterer's shop window. Oh, that cow, she broke off nervously, as though the great wooden cow in the meadow had shocked her and saved her from some indiscretion. Then she shuddered, and then she made the awkward angular movement that I had seen before, as if after the spasm some spot between the shoulders burnt or itched. Then again she looked the most unhappy woman in the world, and I once more reproached her, though not with the same conviction, for if there were a reason, and if I knew the reason, the stigma was removed from life. Sisters-in-law, I said. Her lips pursed as if to spit venom at the word. Pursed they remained. All she did was to take her glove and rub hard at a spot on the window pane. She rubbed as if she would rub something out forever, some stain, some indelible contamination. Indeed, the spot remained for all her rubbing, and back she sank with the shudder and the clutch of the arm I had come to expect. Something impelled me to take my glove and rub my window. There, too, was a little speck on the glass. For all my rubbing it remained. And then the spasm went through me. I crooked my arm and plucked at the middle of my back. My skin, too, felt like the damp chicken's skin in the poulterer's shop window. One spot between the shoulders itched and irritated, felt clammy, felt raw. Could I reach it? Surreptitiously, I tried. She saw me. A smile of infinite irony, infinite sorrow, flitted and faded from her face. But she had communicated. She shared her secret. Past her poison, she would speak no more. Leaning back in my corner, shielding my eyes from her, seeing only the slopes and hollows, grays and purples of the winter landscape, I read her message, deciphered her secret, reading it beneath her gaze. Hilda's the sister-in-law. Hilda. Hilda. Hilda Marsh. Hilda the blooming, the full-bosomed, the matronly. Hilda stands at the door as the cab draws up, holding a coin. Poor Minnie, more of a grasshopper than ever. Old cloak she had last year. Well, well, with two children these days, one can't do more. No, Minnie, I've got it. Here you are, cabby. None of your ways with me. Come in, Minnie. Oh, I could carry you, let alone your basket. So they go into the drawing room. Aunt Minnie, children. Slowly the knives and forks sink from the upright. Down they get, Bob and Barbara, hold out hands stiffly, back again to their chairs, staring between the resumed mouthfuls. But this will skip. Ornaments, curtains, trifois, china plate, yellow oblongs of cheese, white squares of biscuit. Skip. Oh, but wait. Halfway through the luncheon, one of those shivers. Bob stares at her, spoon in mouth. Get on with your pudding, Bob. But Hilda disapproves. Why should she twitch? Skip, skip, till we reach the landing on the upper floor. Stairs, brass-bound, linoleum, worn. Oh, yes, little bedroom looking out over the roofs of Eastbourne. Zigzagging roofs like the spines of caterpillars. This way, that way, striped red and yellow with blue-black slating. Now, Minnie, the doors shut. Hilda heavily descends to the basement. You unstrap the straps of your basket, lay on the bed a meager nightgown, Stand side by side, furred felt slippers. The looking glass. No, you avoid the looking glass. Some methodical disposition of hat pins. Perhaps the shell box has something in it. You shake it. It's the pearl stud there was last year. That's all. And then the sniff, the sigh, the sitting by the window. Three o'clock on a December afternoon. The rain drizzling. One light, low in the skylight, of a drapery emporium. Another high in a servant's bedroom. This one goes out. 
that gives her nothing to look at. A moment's blankness. Then what are you thinking? Hmm. Let me peep across at her opposite. She's asleep, or pretending it. So what would she think about, sitting at the window at three o'clock in the afternoon? Health, money, bills, her god? Yes, sitting on the very edge of the chair looking over the roofs of Eastbourne, Minnie Marsh prays to gods. That's all very well, and she may rub the pain too, as though to see God better. But what god does she see? Who's the god of Minnie Marsh, the god of the back streets of Eastbourne, the god of three o'clock in the afternoon? I, too, see roofs. I see sky. But, oh, dear, this seeing of gods, more like President Kruger than Prince Albert, that's the best I can do for him. And I see him on a chair, in a black frock coat, not so very high up, either. I can manage a cloud or two for him to sit on, and then his hand, trailing in the cloud, holds a rod. A truncheon, is it? Black, thick, thorned. A brutal old bully, Minnie's god. Did he send the itch and the patch and the twitch? Is that why she prays? What she rubs on the window is the stain of sin. Oh, she committed a crime. I have my choice of crimes. The woods flit and fly, in summer there are bluebells, in the opening there, when spring comes, primroses. A parting, was it, twenty years ago? Vows broken? Not Minnie's. She was faithful. How she nursed her mother. All her savings on the tombstone, wreaths under glass, daffodils in jars. Oh, but I'm off track. A crime. They would say she kept her sorrow suppressed her secret. Her sex, they'd say. The scientific people. But what flummery to saddle her with sex? No, more like this. Passing down the streets of Croydon twenty years ago, the violet loops of ribbon in the draper's window, spangled in the electric light, catch her eye. She lingers. Past six. Still, by running, she can reach home. She pushes through the glass swing door. It's sale time. Shallow trays brim with ribbons. She pauses, pulls this, fingers that with the raised roses on it. No need to choose, no need to buy, and each tray with its surprises. We don't shut till seven. And then it is seven. She runs, she rushes, home she reaches, but too late. Neighbors, the doctor, baby brother, the kettle, scalded hospital, dead, or only the shock of it. The blame? Ah, oh, but the detail matters nothing. It's what she carries with her. The spot, the crime, the thing to expiate. Always there between her shoulders. Yes, she seems to nod to me. It's the thing I did. Whether you did or what you did, I don't mind. It's not the thing I want. The draper's window looped with violet. That'll do. A little cheap, perhaps, a little commonplace, since one has a choice of crimes. But then, so many. Let me peep across again. Still sleeping, or pretending sleep. White, worn, the mouth closed. A touch of obstinacy. More than one would think. No hint of sex. So many crimes aren't your crime. Your crime was cheap. Only the retribution, solemn. For now the church door opens, the hard wooden pew receives her, and on the brown tiles she kneels. Every day, winter, summer, dusk, dawn, here she's at it, prays. All her sins fall, fall, forever fall. The spot receives them. It's raised, it's red, it's burning. Next she twitches. Small boy's point. Bob at lunch today. But elderly women are the worst. Indeed, now, you can't sit praying any longer. Kruger sunk beneath the clouds, washed over as with a painter's brush of liquid gray, to which he adds a tinge of black. Even the tip of the truncheon is gone now. That's what always happens. Just as you've seen him, felt him, someone interrupts. It's Hilda now. How you hate her. She'll even lock the bathroom door overnight, too. 
though it's only cold water you want, and sometimes when the night's been bad it seems as if washing helped. And John at breakfast, the children. Meals are the worst, and sometimes there are friends. Ferns don't altogether hide em. They guess, too. So out you go along the front, where the waves are gray and the papers blow, and the glass shelters green and drafty, and the chairs cost tuppence too much, for there must be preachers along the sand. Ah, that's a funny man. That's a man with parakeets. Poor little creatures. Is there no one here who thinks of God? Just up there over the pier with his rod. But no, there's nothing but gray in the sky, or if it's blue, the white clouds hide him, and the music. It's military music. And what are they fishing for? Do they catch them? How the children stare. Well, home a back way. The words have meaning. Might have been spoken by the old man with whiskers. Well, no, 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 he didn't really speak. But everything has meaning. Placards leaning against doorways, names above window shops, red fruit in baskets, women's heads in the hairdressers, all say Minnie Marsh. But here's a jerk. Eggs are cheaper. That's what always happens. I was heading over the waterfall straight for madness when, like a flock of dream sheep, she turns the other way and runs between my fingers. Eggs are cheaper. Tethered to the shore of the world, none of the crimes, sorrows, rhapsodies, or insanities for poor Minnie Marsh. Never late for luncheon, never caught in a storm without a Macintosh, never utterly unconscious of the cheapness of eggs. So she reaches home, scrapes her boots. Have I read you right? But the human face, the human face at the top of the fullest sheet of print holds more withholds more. Now, eyes open, she looks out, and in the human eye, how do you find, how do you define it? There's a break, a division, so that when you've grasped the stem, the butterfly's off, the moth that hangs in the evening over the yellow flower, move, raise your hand, off, high away. I won't raise my hand. Hang still, then quiver, life, soul, spirit, whatever you are, Minnie Marsh, I, too, on my flower, the hawk over the down, alone. Or what were the worth of life? To rise, hang still in the evening, in the midday, hang still over the down, the flicker of a hand, off, up, then poised again, alone, unseen, seeing all so still down there, all so lovely, none seeing, none caring, the eyes of others our prisons, their thoughts our cages, Air above, air below, and the moon and immortality. Oh, but I drop to the turf. Are you down too? You in the corner? What's your name, woman? Minnie Marsh? Some such name as that. There she is, tight to her blossom, opening her handbag from which she takes a hollow shell. An egg. Who was saying that eggs were cheaper? You or I? Oh, it was you who said it on the way home, you remember? When the old gentleman suddenly opening his umbrella, or sneezing, was it? Anyhow, Kruger went, and you came home a back way, and scraped your boots. Yes, and now you lay across your knees a pocket handkerchief, into which drop little angular fragments of eggshell, fragments of a map, a puzzle. I wish I could piece them together, if you would only sit still. She moved her knees. The map's in bits again. Down the slopes to the Andes, the white blocks of marble go bounding and hurtling, crushing to death a whole troop of Spanish muleteers with their convoy. Drake's booty, gold and silver. But to return. To what? To where? She opened the door, and putting her umbrella in the stand, well, that goes without saying, so, too, the whiff of beef from the basement, dot, dot, dot. But what I cannot thus eliminate, what I must, head down, eyes shut, with the courage of a battalion, with the blindness of a bull, charge and disperse, are indubitably the figures behind the fern. Commercial travelers. There, I've hidden them all this time in a hope that somehow they disappear. Or better still, emerge, as indeed they must, if the story is to go on, gathering richness and rotundity, 
destiny and tragedy, as stories should, rolling along with it two, if not three, commercial travelers and a whole grove of aspidistra. The fronds of the aspidistra only partly concealed the commercial traveler. <laughs> Rhododendrons would conceal him utterly, and into the bargain give me my fling of red and white, for which I starve and strive. But rhododendrons in Eastbourne, in December, on the marsh's table? No, no, I dare not. It's all a matter of crusts and cruets, frills and ferns. Perhaps there'll be a moment later by the sea. Moreover, I feel pleasantly pricking through the green fretwork and over the glaciers of cut glass a desire to peer and peep at the man opposite. One's as much as I can manage. James Mogridge, is it? Whom the marshes call Jimmy. Minnie, you must promise not to twitch till I've got this all straight. James Mogridge travels in, shall we say, buttons? But the time's not right for bringing them in. The big and the little on the long cards, some peacock-eyed, others dull gold, cairngorms some, and others coral sprays. But I say the time's not come. He travels, and on Thursdays, his Eastbourne day, takes his meal with the marshes. His red face, his little steady eyes, by no means, altogether commonplace. His enormous appetite, that's safe. He won't look at Minnie till the bread's swamped with the gravy dry. Napkin tucked diamond-wise. But this is primitive, and whatever it may do the reader... Don't take me in. Let's dodge to the Mogridge household. Set that in motion. Well, the family's boots are mended on Sundays by James himself. He reads truth, but his passion? Roses. And his wife, a retired hospital nurse? Hmm, interesting. For God's sake, let me have one woman with a name I like. But no, she's of the unborn children of the mind, illicit nonetheless loved, like my rhododendrons. How many die in every novel that's written, the best, the dearest, while Mogridge lives. It's life's fault. Here's Minnie eating her egg at the moment opposite, and at the other end of the line. Oh, are we past Lou's? There must be Jimmy, or what's her twitch for? There must be Mogridge. Life's fault. Life imposes her laws. Life blocks the way. Life behind the fern. Life's the tyrant. Oh, but not the bully. No, for I assure you, I come willingly. I come wooed by heaven knows what compulsion across ferns and cruets, tables splashed and bottles smeared. I come irresistibly to lodge myself somewhere on the firm flesh, in the robust spine, wherever I can penetrate or find foothold on the person, in the soul of Mogridge the man. The enormous stability of the fabric, the spine tough as whalebone, straight as oak tree, the ribs radiating branches, the flesh taut tarpaulin, the red hollows, the suck and regurgitation of the heart, while from above meat falls in brown cubes and beer gushes to be churned to blood again. And so we reach the eyes. Behind the aspidistra, they see something. Black, white, dismal. Now the plate again. Behind the aspidistra, they see elderly women. Marsh's sister, Hilda's more my sort. The tablecloth now. Marsh would know what's wrong with Morris's. Talk that over. Cheese has come. The plate again. Turn it round. The enormous fingers. Now the woman opposite. Marsh's sister. Not a bit like Marsh. Wretched elderly female. You should feed your hens. God's truth. What set her twitching? Not what I said. Oh, dear, dear, dear. These elderly women. Dear, dear. Yes, Minnie, I know you've twitched. But one moment. James Mogridge. Dear, dear, dear. How beautiful the sound is, like the knock of a mallet on seasoned timber, like the throb of the heart of an ancient whaler when the seas press thick and the green is clouded. Dear, dear, what a passing bell for the souls of the fretful to soothe them and solace them, lap them in linen, saying, So long, good luck to you, and then, 
What's your pleasure? For though Mogridge would pluck his rose for her, that's done. That's over. Now, what's the next thing? Madam, you'll miss your train. For they don't linger. That's the man's way. That's the sound that reverberates. That's St. Paul's and the motor omnibuses. But we're brushing the crumbs off. Oh, Mogridge, won't you stay? You must be off. Are you driving through Eastbourne this afternoon in one of those little carriages? Are you the man who's walled up in green cardboard boxes and sometimes has blinds down and sometimes sits so solemn staring like a sphinx and always there's a look of the sepulchre, something of the undertaker, the coffin, and the dusk about horse and driver? Do tell. But the doors slam. We shall never meet again. Mogridge, farewell. Yes, yes, I'm coming. Right up to the top of the house. One moment I'll linger. How the mud goes round in the mind. What a swirl these monsters leave. The waters rocking, the weeds waving, and green here, black there, striking to the sand, till by degrees the atoms reassemble. The deposits sift itself, and again through the eyes one sees clear and still. And there comes to the lips some prayer for the departed, some obsequy for the souls of those one nods to, the people one never meets again. James Mogridge is dead now, gone forever. Well, Minnie, I can face it no longer. If she said that, let me look at her. She is brushing the eggshells into deep declivities. She said it certainly, leaning against the wall of the bedroom and plucking at the little balls which edge the claret-colored curtain. But when the self speaks to the self, who is speaking? And the entombed soul, the spirit driven in, 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 to the central catacomb, the self that took the veil and left the world, a coward perhaps, yet somehow beautiful as it flits with its lantern restlessly up and down the dark corridors, I can bear it no longer, her spirit says. That man at lunch, Hilda, the children. Oh, heavens, her sob. It's the spirit wailing its destiny, the spirit driven hither, thither, lodging on the diminishing carpets, meager footholds, shrunken shreds of all the vanishing universe, love, life, faith, husband, children, I know not what splendors and pageantries glimpsed in girlhood. Not for me, not for me. But then, the muffins, the bald elderly dog, bead mats, I should fancy, and the consolation of underlinen. If Minnie Marsh were run over and taken to hospital, nurses and doctors themselves would exclaim, There's the vista and the vision. There's the distance. The blue blot at the end of the avenue. While well, after all, the tea is rich, the muffin hot, and the dog. Benny, to your basket, sir, and see what mother's brought you. So taking the glove with the worn thumb, defying once more the encroaching demon of what's called going in holes, you renew the fortifications, threading the grey wool, running it in and out. Running it in and out, across and over, spinning a web through which God himself, hush, don't think of God, how firm the stitches are, you must be proud of your darning. Let nothing disturb her. Let the light fall gently, and the clouds show an inner vest of the first green leaf. Let the sparrow perch on the twig and shake the raindrop hanging to the twig's elbow. Why look up? Was it a sound? A thought? Oh, heavens! Back again to the thing you did? The plate glass with the violet loops? But Hilda will come. Ignominies, humiliations, oh! close the breach. Having mended her glove, Minnie Marsh lays it in the drawer. She shuts the drawer with decision. I catch sight of her face in the glass. Lips are pursed, chin held high. Next, she laces her shoes. Then she touches her throat. What's your brooch? Mistletoe or merry thought? And what is happening? 
Unless I'm much mistaken, the pulse has quickened. The moment's come. The threads are racing. Niagara's ahead. Here's the crisis. Heaven be with you. Down she goes. Courage, courage. Face it. Be it. For God's sake, don't wait on the mat now. There's the door. I'm on your side. Speak. Confront her. Confront her soul. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes, this is Eastbourne. I'll reach it down for you. Let me try the handle. But Minnie, though we keep up pretenses, I've read you right. I'm with you now. That's all your luggage? Much obliged, I'm sure. But why do you look about you? Hilda won't come to the station, nor John, and Mogridge is driving at the far side of Eastburn. I'll wait by my bag, ma'am. That's the safest. He said he'd meet me. Oh, there he is. That's my son. So they walk off together. Well, but I'm confounded. Surely, Minnie, you know better. A strange man. Stop. I'll tell him, Minnie. Minnie Marsh. I don't know, though. There's something queer in her cloak as it blows. Oh, but it's untrue. It's indecent. Look how he bends as they reach the gateway. She finds her ticket. What's the joke? Off they go down the road, side by side. Well, my world's done for. What do I stand on? What do I know? That's not Minnie. There never was Mogridge. Who am I? Life's bare as bone. And yet the last look of them. He stepping from the curb and she following him round the edge of the big building brims me with wonder, floods me anew. Mysterious figures, mother and son, who are you? Why do you walk down the street? Where tonight will you sleep? And then tomorrow? Oh, how it whirls and surges, floats me afresh. I start after them. People drive this way and that. The white light splutters and pours. Plate glass windows, carnations, chrysanthemums, ivy in dark gardens, milk carts at the door. Wherever I go, mysterious figures, I see you, turning the corner, mothers and sons. You, you, you. I hasten, I follow. This, I fancy, must be the sea. Gray is the landscape, dim as ashes. The water murmurs and moves. If I fall on my knees, if I go through the ritual, the ancient antics, it's you, unknown figures, you I adore. If I open my arms, it's you I embrace, you I draw to me, adorable world. And now, The Mark on the Wall by Virginia Woolf. Perhaps it was the middle of January in the present year that I first looked up and saw The Mark on the Wall. In order to fix a date, it is necessary to remember what one saw. So now I think of the fire, the steady film of yellow light upon the page of my book, the three chrysanthemums in the round glass bowl on the mantelpiece, Yes, it must have been the winter time, and we had just finished our tea, for I remember that I was smoking a cigarette when I looked up and saw the mark on the wall for the first time. I looked up through the smoke of my cigarette, and my eyes lodged for a moment upon the burning coals, and that old fancy of the crimson flag flapping from the castle tower came into my mind, and I thought of the cavalcade of red knights riding up the side of the black rock. Rather to my relief, the sight of the mark interrupted the fantasy, for it is an old fantasy, an automatic fantasy, made as a child, perhaps. The mark was a small round mark, black upon the white wall, about six or seven inches above the mantelpiece. How readily our thoughts swarm upon a new object, lifting it a little away, as ants carry a blade of straw so feverishly, and then leave it, if that mark was made by a nail, it can't have been for a picture. It must have been for a miniature. 
the miniature of a lady with white powdered curls, powder-dusted cheeks, and lips like red carnations. A fraud, of course, for the people who had this house before us would have chosen a picture in that way, an old picture for an old room. That is the sort of people they were, very interesting people, and I think of them so often, in such queer places, because one will never see them again, never know what happened next. They wanted to leave this house because they wanted to change their style of furniture, so he said, and he was in the process of saying that in his opinion art should have ideas behind it when we were suddenly torn asunder, as one is torn from the old lady about to pour out tea and the young man about to hit the tennis ball in the back garden of the suburban villa as one rushes past in the train. But as for that mark, I'm not sure about it. I don't believe it was made by a nail after all. It's too big, too round for that. I might get up, but if I got up and looked at it, ten to one I shouldn't be able to say for certain, because once a thing's done, no one ever knows how it happened. Oh, dear me, the mystery of life, the inaccuracy of thought, the ignorance of humanity. To show how very little control of our possessions we have, what an accidental affair this living is after all our civilization, let me just count over a few of the things lost in one lifetime. Beginning, for that seems always the most mysterious of losses, what cat would gnaw, what rat would nibble, three pale blue canisters of bookbinding tools. Then there were the bird cages, the iron hoops, the steel skates, the Queen Anne coal scuttle, the bagatelle board, the hand organ, all gone, and jewels too, opals and emeralds, they lie about the roots of turnips. What a scrapping, pawing affair it is to be sure. The wonder is that I've any clothes on my back, that I sit surrounded by solid furniture at this moment. Why, if one wants to compare life to anything, one must liken it to being blown through the tube at fifty miles an hour, landing at the other end without a single hairpin in one's hair, shot out at the feet of God entirely naked, tumbling head over heels in the asphodel metals like brown paper parcels pitched down a chute in the post office, with one's hair flying back like the tail of a racehorse. Yes, that seems to express the rapidity of life, the perpetual waste and repair, all so casual, all so haphazard. But after life, the slow pulling down of thick green stalks so that the cup of the flower as it turns over deluges one with purple and red light, why, after all, should one not be born there as one is born here, helpless, speechless, unable to focus one's eyesight, groping at the roots of the grass, at the toes of the giants. As for saying which are trees, and which are men and women, or whether there are such things, that one won't be in a condition to do for fifty years or so. There will be nothing but spaces of light and dark, intersected by thick stalks, and rather high up, perhaps, rose-shaded blots of an indistinct color, dim pinks and blues, which will, as time goes on, become more definite, become... I don't know what. And yet that mark on the wall is not a hole at all. It may even be caused by some round black substance, such as a small rose leaf left over from the summer. And I, not being a very vigilant housekeeper, look at the dust on the mantel, for example, the dust which, so they say, buried Troy three times over, only fragments of pot utterly refusing annihilation, as one can believe. The tree outside the window taps very gently on the pane. I want to think quietly, calmly, spaciously, never to be interrupted, never to have to rise from my chair, to slip easily from one thing to another without any sense of hostility or obstacle. I want to sink deeper and deeper away from the surface with its hard, separate facts. I want to steady myself. Let me catch hold of the first idea that passes. Shakespeare. Well, he will do as well as another. A man who sat himself solidly in an armchair and looked into the fire, so a shower of ideas fell perpetually from some very high heaven down through his mind. He leant his forehead on his hand, and people looking in through the open window 
for this scene is supposed to take place on a summer's evening. But how dull this is, this historical fiction. It doesn't interest me at all. I wish I could hit upon a pleasant track of thought, a track indirectly reflecting credit upon myself, for those are the pleasantest thoughts, and very frequent even in the mind of modest mouse-colored people, who believe genuinely that they dislike to hear their own praises. They are not thoughts directly praising oneself. That is the beauty of them. They are thoughts like this. And then I came into the room. They were discussing botany. I said how I'd seen a flower growing on a dust heap on the site of an old house in Kingsway. The seed, I said, must have been sown in the reign of Charles I. What flowers grew in the reign of Charles I? I asked. But I don't remember the answer. Tall flowers with purple tassels to them, perhaps. And so it goes on. All the time I'm dressing up the figure of myself in my own mind, lovingly, stealthily, not openly adoring it, for if I did that I should catch myself out, and stretch my hand at once for a book in protection. Indeed, it is curious how instinctively one protects the image of oneself from idolatry or any other handling that could make it ridiculous, or too unlike the original to be believed in any longer. Or is it not so very curious after all? It is a matter of great importance. Suppose the looking-glass smashes, the image disappears, and the romantic figure with the green of forest depths all about it is there no longer, but only that shell of a person, which is seen by other people. What an airless, shallow, bald, prominent world it becomes, a world not to be lived in. As we face each other in omnibuses and underground railways, we are looking into the mirror, that accounts for the vagueness, the gleam of glassiness in our eyes. And the novelists in future will realize more and more the importance of these reflections, for of course there is not one reflection but an almost infinite number. Those are the depths they will explore, those the phantoms they will pursue, leaving the description of reality more and more out of their stories, taking a knowledge of it for granted, as the Greeks did, and Shakespeare perhaps. But these generalizations are very worthless. The military sound of the word is enough. It recalls leading articles, cabinet ministers, a thing from which one could not depart, save at the risk of nameless damnation. Generalizations bring back somehow Sunday in London, Sunday afternoon walks, Sunday luncheons, and also ways of speaking of the dead, clothes, and habits like the habit of sitting all together in one room until a certain hour, although nobody liked it. There was a rule for everything. The rule for tablecloths at that particular period was that they should be made of tapestry with little yellow compartments marked upon them, such as you may see in photographs of the carpets of the corridors of the royal palaces. Tablecloths of a different kind were not real tablecloths. How shocking! And yet how wonderful it was to discover that these real things, Sunday lunches, Sunday walks, country houses, and tablecloths, were not entirely real, were indeed half phantoms, and the damnation which visited the disbeliever in them was only a sense of illegitimate freedom. What now takes the place of those things, I wonder, those real standard things? Men, perhaps, should you be a woman— the masculine point of view which governs our lives, which sets the standard, which establishes Whittaker's table of precedency, which has become, I suppose, since the war, half a phantom to many men and women, which soon, one may hope, will be laughed into the dustbin where the phantoms go, the mahogany sideboards and the landseer prints, gods and devils, hell and so forth, leaving us all with an intoxicating sense of illegitimate freedom, if freedom exists. In certain lights, that mark on the wall seems actually to project from the wall, nor is it entirely circular. I cannot be sure, but it seems to cast a perceptible shadow, suggesting that if I ran my finger down the strip of the wall, it would at a certain point mount and descend a small tumulus, a smooth tumulus, like those barrels on the south downs, which are, they say, either tombs or camps. Of the two, I should prefer them to be tombs, desiring melancholy like most English people, and finding it natural at the end of a walk to think of the bones stretched beneath the turf. 
There must be some book about it. Some antiquary must have dug up those bones and given them a name. What sort of a man is an antiquary, I wonder? Retired colonels, for the most part, I dare say, leading parties of aged laborers to the top here, examining clods of earth and stone, and getting into correspondence with the neighboring clergy, which, being opened at breakfast time, gives them a feeling of importance, and the comparison of arrowheads necessitates cross-country journeys to the county towns, an agreeable necessity both to them and to their elderly wives, who wish to make plum jam or to clean out the study, and have every reason for keeping that great question of the camp or the tomb in perpetual suspension, while the colonel himself feels agreeably philosophic in accumulating evidence on both sides of the question. It is true that he does finally incline to believe in the camp, and being opposed, indicts a pamphlet which he is about to read at the quarterly meeting of the local society when a stroke lays him low, and his last conscious thoughts are not of wife or child, but of the camp and the arrowhead there, which is now in the case at the local museum, together with the foot of a Chinese murderess, a handful of Elizabethan nails, a great many Tudor clay pipes, a piece of Roman pottery, and the wine glass that Nelson drank out of. Proving, I really don't know what. No, no, nothing is proved, nothing is known. And if I were to get up, at this very moment, and ascertain that the mark on the wall is really, what shall we say, the head of a giant old nail driven in two hundred years ago, which has now, owing to the patient attrition of many generations of housemaids, revealed its head above the coat of paint, and is taking its first view of modern life in the sight of a white-walled firelit room, what should I gain? Knowledge? Matter for further speculation? I can think sitting as well as standing up. And what is knowledge? What are our learned men, say the descendants of witches and hermits who crouched in caves and in woods, brewing herbs, interrogating shrew mice, and writing down the language of the stars? And the less we honor them as our superstitions dwindle, and our respect for beauty and health of mind increases, yes, one could imagine a very pleasant world, a quiet, spacious world with the flowers so red and blue in the open fields, a world without professors or specialists or housekeepers with the profiles of policemen, a world which one can slice with one's thought. As a fish slices the water with his fin, grazing the stems of the water lilies, hanging suspended over nests of white sea eggs. How peaceful it is down here, rooted in the center of the world, and gazing up through the gray waters with their sudden gleams of light and their reflections. Oh, if it were not for Whitaker's almanac, if it were not for the table of precedency. I must jump up and see for myself what the mark on the wall really is. A nail, a rose leaf, a crack in the wood. Ah, oh, here is nature once more at her old game of self-preservation, this train of thought, she perceives, is threatening mere waste of energy, even some collision with reality, for who will ever be able to lift a finger against Whitaker's table of precedency? The Archbishop of Canterbury is followed by the Lord High Chancellor, the Lord High Chancellor is followed by the Archbishop of York, everybody follows somebody. Such is the philosophy of Whitaker, and the great thing is to know who follows whom. Whitaker knows, and let that, so nature counsels, comfort you, instead of enraging you. And if you can't be comforted, if you must shatter this hour of peace, think of the mark on the wall. I understand nature's game, her prompting to take action as a way of ending any thought that threatens to excite or to pain. Hence, I suppose, comes our slight contempt for men of action, men we assume who don't think, Still, there's no harm in putting a full stop to one's disagreeable thoughts by looking at a mark on the wall. Indeed, now that I have fixed my eyes upon it, I feel that I have grasped a plank in the sea. I feel a satisfying sense of reality, which at once turns the two archbishops and the Lord High Chancellor to the shadows of shades. Here is something definite, something real, thus waking from a midnight dream of horror. One hastily turns on the light and lies quiescent. 
worshipping the chest of drawers, worshipping solidity, worshipping reality, worshipping the impersonal world, which is a proof of some existence other than ours. That is what one wants to be sure of. Wood is a pleasant thing to think about. It comes from a tree, and trees grow, and we don't know how they grow. For years and years they grow without paying any attention to us, in meadows and forests and by the side of the rivers, all things one likes to think about. The cows swish their tails beneath them on hot afternoons. They paint rivers so green that when a moor hen dives, one expects to see its feathers all green when it comes up again. I like to think of fish balanced against the stream like flags blown out, and of water beetles slowly raising domes of mud upon the bed of the river. I like to think of the tree itself. First, the close, dry sensation of being wood, then the grinding of the storm, then the slow, delicious ooze of sap. I like to think of it, too, on winter's nights, standing in the empty field with all the leaves close-furled, nothing tender exposed to the iron bullets of the moon, a naked mast upon an earth that goes tumbling, tumbling all night long. The song of birds must sound very loud and strange in June, and how cold the feet of insects must feel upon it as they make laborious progresses up the creases of the bark or sun themselves upon the thin green awning of the leaves and look straight in front of them with diamond-cut red eyes. One by one the fibers snap beneath the immense cold pressure of the earth. Then the last storm comes, and falling, the highest branches drive deep into the ground again. Even so, life isn't done with. There are a million patient, watchful lives still for a tree, all over the world, in bedrooms, in ships, on the pavement, lining rooms where men and women sit after tea smoking cigarettes. It is full of peaceful thoughts, happy thoughts, this tree. I should like to take each one separately. But something is getting in the way. Where was I? Oh, what has it all been about? A tree? A river, the downs, Whitaker's Almanac, the fields of asphodel. I can't remember a thing. Everything's moving, falling, slipping, vanishing. There is a vast upheaval of matter. Someone is standing over me and saying, I'm going out to buy a newspaper. Yes? Though it's no good buying newspapers. Nothing ever happens. Curse this war. Damn this war. All the same. I don't see why we should have a snail on our wall. Ah, the mark on the wall. It was a snail. And that's our show for this evening. I hope you enjoyed these two stories by Virginia Woolf. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.